What's the greatest challenge to someone who professionally teaches the Book of Mormon at BYU? Semester in, semester out. It's simple, really. Although my students generally settle into their seats on the first day of class with earnest faces and an obedient demeanor, the fact is that most of them are preparing themselves for what they think is inevitable, the same old thing. Mm -hmm. Heaven help them, so many of them can endure repetitiveness and boredom in religious contexts with astonishing patience. <laughs> uh, but the fact is that they just aren't planning on getting much of anything new out of reading the Book of Mormon. They tend to feel they know the characters, the stories, the sermons, the doctrine. It's all old hat, and they're quietly pining for something new. My challenge then is always the same, to see how quickly I can help my students to grasp that they've barely so much as opened the Book of Mormon. And what better place to start than Lehi's dream of the tree? Is there anything in the Book of Mormon that regular readers and dutiful churchgoers are more familiar with? The pathway through the dream is one the saints talk about traveling so often that its rods and rivers and mists and mansions have long since become just part of the terrain. If they know anything about the Book of Mormon, they know this. And so, once we've gone through the syllabus and answered questions about grades and expectations, I take them to Lehi's dream. And after just 45 minutes, they're all quite sure they now know next to nothing about the Book of Mormon. <laughs> They've felt its truth, uh, and they've found the divine in its pages, but they've assumed too much about their depth of familiarity. But now, they're ready to begin. That's my task. Uh, the question I most often ask in podcasts and on other popular occasions is this. How do I learn to read the Book of Mormon better, more slowly, with greater capacity for learning? And for my money, that's what Approaching the Tree, this book we've put together, is all about. What happens when we take the most familiar story in the whole of the Book of Mormon and then sit with it long enough that it starts to look quite unfamiliar? What happens when scholars do that? But also, and this is what's sitting just beyond those doors at the back of the room, what happens when artists do that? Lehi's Dream of the Tree is so many people's entryway into the spiritual world the Book of Mormon presents to its readers. Uh, why not let it be an entryway also into reading the book with renewed and refreshed eyes? My contribution to the project, uh, apart from whatever editorial labors we shared out amongst us uh, in shepherding the book to completion, was to survey what scholars have had to say in the past about the dream of the tree. Where have the saints' many travels with this dream taken us, at least in as much as those travels have been reported in print? I had to lead to others seven others, in fact, read the book, uh, I had to leave to others to decide what more might be said after all that's already been said. I spent my time in the library, uh, letting scholars from past decades walk me through what they found in the dream, and I learned a great deal. And let me be clear, I don't know that I learned about the dream of the tree itself, so much as I learned about how differently people have worked to make sense of the Book of Mormon. Because the dream of the tree is so familiar, uh, there may be more written about it than about most any other part of the Book of Mormon. To read through what's been said about the dream is therefore to come to see how the study of the Book of Mormon has changed over the decades. Occasionally, of course, I encountered some interpretation or other that was really convincing that I'll want to have in mind whenever I read Lehi's dream again, to let God be seen more clearly. But much more often, I felt like I was coming to get a feel for the arc the Book of Mormon has traced through Latter-day Saint intellectual history. And that's something of real value in and of itself. At the very least, to know that history is to know just how open the interpretation of a text like 1 Nephi 8 really is or can be. Earnest and honest readers with a host of different aims and hopes have worked to make sense of the dream, and they collectively show that we're always free to ask new questions and to expect new answers about the meaning of the dream and about the God it reveals to us. The dream isn't one thing, it's many. It certainly has been many things, and it's just as certain to be many more. The essays and artworks you can find in this volume outline some of the new things the dream is turning out to be uh, for the saints right here and right now. 
let me now share with you, uh, with you all just a brief sketch of what I found in the history of how scholars have read and understood Lehi's dream, lest you leave feeling like I stated but didn't show that there's a lot of interesting history there. Uh, the history of the dream's interpretation divides naturally into three broad and somewhat overlapping periods. I'm going to sketch a brief history, and it's going to be a bit triumphalist. <laughs> During the first period, stretching from the mid-1940s to the mid-1980s, scholars writing about Lehi's dream and about the Book of Mormon more generally predominantly wrote about it from a specifically historical point of view. Each of the three great founders of academic study of the Book of Mormon, Sidney Sperry, Wells Jakeman, and Hugh Nibley, had something to say about the dream, and each took his own historical angle on the text. Sperry worked to fit the dream into a historically reconstructable genre. Jakeman labored to connect the dream to known archaeological finds from ancient Mesoamerica. And Nibley compared the dream's imagery to things found in pre-modern Arabian desert life. Later heirs to these founding figures developed and sharpened, and in some cases corrected, these early historicizations of the dream. But really, uh, really new approaches to the dream didn't surface until a second period of study arose. The second period stretched from the mid-1970s into the 2010s as representative of a new aspiringly dominant force, and it featured scholars who came at the dream from a primarily literary perspective. In the late, in the late 1970s, a flurry of literary treatments appeared, most impressively Bruce Jorgensen's typological interpretation of the dream. But the culture wars of the 1980s, which continued into the 1990s, put literary readers somewhat on the defensive. Further literary treatments during those decades, such as those by Richard Rust and Mark Thomas, tended to divide along the lines of the resulting uh, culture wars, enlisting literary insights in the service either of the Book of Mormon's ancient origins or of the Book of Mormon's modern origins. It was all fighting. Uh, what filled the void a bit during those years was, one, a doctrinal approach to the dream, that is a style of reading, uh, of reading it that put it in the service of confirming the official teachings of the church, and two, a few further historical studies in the vein of earlier decades, follow-ups on Nibley especially. By the early 2000s, though, uh, literary study of the Book of Mormon was back on the agenda, and a remarkable collection of literary studies of the dream have appeared in the years since, essays especially by Amy Easton Flake, Grant Hardy, and Charles Swift. And during the same first decade of the new millennium, there began a third period, that continues quite strongly into the present, or so I'm going to assert, uh, represented best in all kinds of ways by this very book we're launching today. The currently dominant approach in scholarly writing on the dream is specifically theological. And this began with forays by Terrell Givens and, well, myself, uh, borrowing literary tools for the work of interpretation, but then uh, putting the results of that literary work into the service of understanding the divine quite specifically. But really, uh, these works were just trumpets heralding a whole lot more theology that's still to come, beginning with the remarkable treatments you can find in approaching the tree. The theological era of Book of Mormon study has just begun, but it's already a tree that's bearing interesting fruit. I highly recommend you sample some of what's being done. As I said, this outline of history of how scholars have made sense of Lehi's dream is also an outline of the history of how scholars have made sense of the Book of Mormon in general, Historical approaches to the Book of Mormon dominated for half a century before literary and also doctrinal approaches to the book began to appear, however hesitantly at first. And in recent years, we've watched as literary work on the Book of Mormon has begun to be bent in the direction of theological reflection. It's as if historians and literary critics and doctrinal scholars as well have collectively helped us to see just where to find the end of the iron rod that is the Book of Mormon, that is the Word of God, which will lead us through the dark to an encounter with Christ. In my clearly biased view, theologians are holding firmly to the rod that previous generations of scholarship have helped them to identify, are following that rod toward the end of the path it runs along, and are calling back through the darkness to say something about the beauty of the tree they're seeing as they draw closer to it. It's worth listening to what the theologians are saying, I think. They aren't prophets, let's be clear. None of them is Lehi, standing squarely at the foot of the tree and calling others to enjoy its fruits with divine authority. But I do think 
they're shining some light amid a great many mists of darkness. And so long as they keep their eyes squarely on the tree that lies ahead of them, they, we, stand to do some real good. Thank you.